Let's rock and roll, brothers. My friends from the UK. Yes. Welcome, Carlos. How are you? I'm doing good. This is not soda, though. It's uh, called bubbly. It's sparkling water, all right? Come on. Nice. I did think it was a cola, so I'm glad you clarified. <laughs> I got the coffee, though. My coffee brand here. Can you read it? Stay humble. Nice. I like that. Yeah. That's good. Firstly, love the uh, love the backdrop, love the room. Yeah. Uh, well, what happened is you realize that teaching jujitsu at a dojo is the brick and mortar. Becoming a media person that's adapting to today's world. And mm. I, I've been busy doing a lot of stuff. So now I'm trying to line up to how I can make my voice heard and reach out to more people. You know, so yeah. we're going towards that path. Let's put it this way. Yeah, it's, it's the way to go. I think it's the uh, the future of marketing. So uh, yeah, so yeah, good. And tell us about the clocks. You got a few clocks there. Oh man, my brother Jean Jacques. Uh, let me tell him real quick something. Fala Jean Jacques, tudo bem, campeão? Hello. Love that we're on a podcast and John Jacques Mercado's just called and interrupted. <laughs> Hey, just while we're waiting, remember no swearing on this one. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, money in the jar, mate. Oh, no, right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it cover the cost of the, the podcast room, mate. So, uh... all right. So, I'm going to put my phone on airplane mode. You guys cool? Yeah. Yeah, all good, mate. Now we can be at peace. So I was admiring your your room there, and you were telling us about obviously the uh, the, the the step into video marketing, um, and I was admiring your clocks. I think you were going to tell us uh, why you've got so many clocks in your room. Sure. <laughs> uh, there's a a saying that uh, uh, sound equals through time, right? So there's a correlation, and then you use the word sound mechanics sound mechanics it equals through time so when you learn something that has strong fundamentals and sound mechanics you'll be able to replicate in continuity so what i try to find when i teach is how can i stretch the moment of inception of knowledge to development of a pattern that can be successfully replicated in the future so it's not an isolated case i've had several students that i taught something 15 years ago in a seminar that i don't even remember and then i meet the guy several years later and he he or she mentions hey how are you doing sir i learned this move i still do it and it still works so that's how i came to that that idea you know and the other thing too the name of the podcast would be coffee time with carlos machado so you guys know when it's coffee time it's time to Enjoy your coffee and go at it. Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. Everyone will know watching this, I'm sure, but obviously you're a eighth degree coral belt. And I think that was some like coral belt level information right there. <laughs> yeah. But it's an absolute honor, Carlos. You're the, the, the first coral belt we've spoken to. The first? Yeah. I mean, there's not it's many serious. around as, as you well know, but yeah, the first one. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm honored. We're honored. I made, yeah. I made my claim to fame right now. <laughs> Well, the thing is, I'm on the trenches. You see what I'm saying? Because a lot of times, let's say if you have accolades or recognition, you start to feel that, you know, you change your ways and just stay behind the scenes or don't get into the the daily grind. And I feel that uh, if I was in the troops, I wouldn't be in a tent with AC. I would try to be on the trenches with the troops, you know, whether to motivate or mentor them or just to be there fighting with them. So I'm actually surprised that you said that, you know, I, I was, there's quite a few coral bells that have so much 
knowledge and experience to share, you'll be a pain if they don't. Yeah. Well, maybe the, the first of many then, I'm sure. I, I'll promote, I promise. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's probably the fact that you are, as you say, relatively active still and still in the trenches. So, you know, we as you sort of delve deeper into social media, we see more and more of your content. We see you coaching. We see you sharing your knowledge. So, you know, I think for us, it was an obvious first choice. Um, if we were to choose any coral belt, I think uh, I think you've seen the obvious one. So, uh, so again, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And obviously, it's a it's a huge achievement, one that you know many can only dream of. And you know, even a black belt in jujitsu is a huge achievement. I mean, getting that coral belt, like, what did that mean to you at the time? You know, uh, people talk about rank, and sometimes you have like uh, two answers. You know, one is you accumulate time, you accumulate accumulate sacrifice, uh, you you gain knowledge, you share knowledge. You go full circle and you continue to be curious about it. And then I guess you progress at a point in time. Uh, I think I think for me, what the core belt meant was, man, he ain't done yet. You know what I'm saying? Because now what I want is to make sure everybody who's below me can reach my level. So it, it didn't become sort of like a, an achievement per se. It became a reminder that I still have a lot of work to do, you know? But of course, you know, uh, when people call me master, um, the way I operate is on the mat to have the etiquette. You know, everybody, I address most people like Mr. or Mrs. And uh, I call people sir when I'm on the mat. And it, it's kind of like odd for some jiu-jitsu schools because they think it's too based on karate or, or stuff. But I, I feel it's an atmosphere of respect. I just want to... so. Inside the academy on the mat, they call me my master Machado. Outside, they call me Carlos. You know, I wear different hats depending where I am. You know, I'm the real me no matter where I am, but you don't have to call me master outside my place. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think it was a few years ago you got you got the eighth degree, right? So you must be getting relatively close to the ninth. Oh, don't remind me of that, man. Uh, it's still yeah. there. Like I, th I think there's uh, some years ahead. You know, I'm not anticipating it because then I feel if you become red belt, then you get re you realize you're getting old. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, there's not yet. Yeah. I, I still have so much stuff to. If I'm a core belt forever and that's all I got, it still won't change my perspective. You know, but the only reason I would say rank would mean anything for me uh, or to me is to give some reference for the people below me, you know, but not necessarily because I want more uh, recognition. And I'm not trying to play humble. It's just the way I think. No, I understand that. And, and apologies for reminding you of, your, of you of your age again, but how long how long have you been training jiu-jitsu for to have achieved <laughs> that belt? Uh, four, 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 four years old, I started, uh, I turned 60 last November, so 56. Wow. Maybe That's a insane. couple months here and there missing class, missing uh, training, but for the most part active. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing long time. And and of course, you come from a, a family of, uh, of martial artists, grew up in a, in a house with five brothers. I think you were the oldest, right? That's correct. I learned how to share the power from the onset because my, my brothers are all bigger than me and they all did jiu-jitsu, so... <laughs> I wanted to ask what, like thinking back to your, to like your younger years and your childhood, what that house must have been like with five boys or, or training jujitsu. Yeah. What was it like at home? It was a positive uh, rivalry. Uh, we all trained and we all reminded each other that we, keep, we, we should keep on training because if any of us slacked, the other ones will make sure, you know, whoever was a slacker would pay whenever they got back on the mats. So... We, we stayed honest. Every house that we lived had mats. So a lot of times when we were gathering together, if there was a technique or a troubleshoot, or if you wanted to just do extra roles, we had a place and time that we could do it, you know, in, in the blink of an eye. And also in places, I remember even when we had carpets, you know, I called the coffee table uh, conversation. You move the coffee table out of the way and just use the carpet you know, to go over whatever it is, you know, how many UFC parties we actually would watch the fights and then uh, move the coffee table along. So, oh, do this like that and try to figure out 
what would be the best option in many of the scenarios that we just you know watched you know those you know those fights it's fun yeah i bet and and was there any any one of you that was the uh, the toughest of of the siblings of the brothers i compare my brothers to the the x men <laughs> they're all mutants of some sort you know Higa was twice my size with the equivalent of more skills than me so he was like me fi fighting against my bigger version of myself. It was not fun. Uh, Jean-Jacques was like a cat, uh, you know, mixed up with a snake. He was just like, but moving all over town and had that Duracell battery that he will never say stop anytime. If you roll with him, you go forever, you know. Uh, John was a mix of Hegan and Roger, no, excuse me, Hegan and Jean-Jacques. And Roger was more zen. Roger actually was the most fun to roll because he was not as aggressive so he he liked to kind of like give you some space and go still very athletic and strong and technical so so for me uh i think he had the edge on, on size jean jacques had the edge on mobility you know uh but we all gave each other all the money that was worth you know it was not an easy match no matter who we went against you know so and, and I think it, it was pretty balanced for the most part. You know, sometimes we'd get each other in a submission and stuff, you know. And I mean, the oldest, I, at one point in time, I didn't like much getting submitted by my younger brothers. But, you know, you realize that, man, it's part of life, you know. The young guns, they'll come, you know. Yeah, what an amazing environment to grow up in, though, huh? Yeah, well, it's just, just fighting each other, getting better and just... You know, it's so lucky, really, isn't it? We used to do round robins, like one guy in the middle going against all the other four brothers, and then the last one would stay and then repeat again. When I went through those, uh, and you wouldn't stop, no matter if you got submitted or not, you, you had to do a certain amount of time, and you had to go through every brother before you had a chance to rest. And I swear, I swear to God, I didn't care who I had to go against after I did that, you know, doing round robbing with my brothers, I felt like I don't care. I could go against anybody. I, I'm okay after what I had to go through, you know. And and tell us what um what like training was like, you know, at the academy when you were, you know, sort of teenagers. Like what what do you remember from those days? It's you know, it's obviously times moved on a little bit in regard to sort of jujitsu, which we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah, tell us about those early days. So. For you to have an idea, it was not uncommon for us to train seven days a week. You know, it, it, even on the weekends, we would do cardio, we would work out, and then we had mats wherever we went. We would go out of town. We had some friends that had, uh, you know, uh, home gyms that we would go to. And, and this I relate to my cousins, too. You know, my cousins, you have pictures of uh, the big manor house that my uncle Carlos Gracie had at that time. And they would put that canvas on the grass. And then people would just keep training and stuff like a group session in, in, in a garden, you know, in a backyard. Uh, but uh, I think it was a, a mixture of a lifestyle uh, and legacy some, somehow mixed up. You know, that, that's, that's part of the lifestyle. But I think the legacy part had, had an impact on it because, uh, at least with my brothers, you know, we could have had other interests. But we always felt that jiu-jitsu was the path that was presented to us right from the beginning. And it became a very natural uh, adaptation and transition, you know. And it's amazing when you have an entire family that's so uh, large uh, between my brothers and my cousins that, man, it was just like no matter where you went, you had the best training partners to play with. And everybody was encouraging of each other. You get your butt kicked, but they will tell you what was wrong, and then next time you you go and do better. You know the the, the it was a hum, hum, uh, humbling, let's say, uh, upbringing to put this way, because you always had people that knew more than you, were older, more experienced, you know, more advanced, and then others there at your level, others who are below you, and and sometimes you know things would switch, or like I said, the young guns would come and grow and get better. So. Uh, it, it, it was uh, amazing for me. Uh, you know, it was very, very great, great memories I have from Brazil. Uh, now, in terms of mat time, we literally didn't have a measure. We spent hours on the mat. 
you know, and, and once you start teaching, though, it, it, you have to have that balancing act. When do you teach your students? But then we would roll with everybody doing class, and then we would roll amongst ourselves afterwards. So we never kind of relented a bit the, the amount of mat time that we put. But I think it was less structured at the time compared to what jiu-jitsu is today. That's more methodical. You have uh, so many more people doing it, so many more great coaches giving their input that I think the art didn't evolve only in the martial arts aspect of it alone, but I think on the approach in which the instruction uh, is formatted, you know. Yeah, sounds sounds incredible. And, and and thinking back to that time, you know, with your brothers and your cousins, did you ever imagine it would become such a a big thing? You know, did you even aspire to it, or was it just not on the radar at all? Yeah, you I tell you this, man. Uh, this is an interesting perspective. When you're part of history, you don't you don't realize until much time later. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, I remember arriving in the United States in 1990. You know, I had no idea what kind of uh, magnitude uh, jiu-jitsu would uh, become, you know, or reach uh, the level, you know. And then uh, I remember 93 after the first UFC with Hoyce and then, you know, but even before then, there was such a, there was such a demand on the garage dojos uh, that were in California under my cousin Horan Gracie at that time, they had a few garage dojos that would accommodate a couple cars. So you could fit like 25 people and ongoing group, uh, not group, uh, privates and semi-private classes throughout the day. You know, so they, they had a very high demand even before then. You know, the word or mouth was spreading out quite fast. And of course, uh, with events like the UFC popularized even more. And then I guess uh, a lot of amazing instructors from Brazil migrated to the United States and eventually became a movement, you know, and then uh, uh, practitioners of the United States became, became instructors on their own right. And then of course, exporting to Europe, like UK and other countries. So it's just like a phenomenon. You know, I think it was, you could definitely see uh, the dividing waters in martial arts history, in my opinion, before and after the popularization of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, since it came to the United States. Obviously, the UFC was a massively pivotal moment, I think, for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, showcasing it to the world against other martial arts. But prior to that, there were stories of obviously the Gracie challenges and, you know, the, the fights with like uh, Luta Livre and that type of thing. I mean, do you think it was a build up of a, a number of these things that ultimately led it to, to being so popular? Do you think there was one or two moments that really kind of transitioned it? I can tell you that you always can choose the approach in, in which you want to promote the art. You can do the challenge, which I think had its merit in the way it awakened, uh, you know, the public. You had events like UFC that put jujitsu with somebody who was not physically uh, with any attributes uh, compared to some of the other guys that he went against on no weight division and fighting more than one match at a time. Those things uh, really is hard to fathom in today's world where everybody cross trains, everybody has a different level of conditioning and expertise. They're a lot more specialized in the different aspects of the martial arts. So there's no way you could replicate the same circumstances in today's world. But at that time, I think that's what precipitated things to become what, what they became. Now, my uncle Carlos Gracie, one thing he told me uh, before, but last thing that I heard from him before I came to America, because after that, I spent four years in the United States and he passed away in 1994, uh, you know, four years, like I said, after my arrival here. But that was the very last words that came out of his mouth while he was alive, when I was interacting with him, before, you know, the last time I saw him, that's what he told me. He said, remember, remember when you get to America, be humble because you are, we already did, meaning him and Uncle Helio and all the other generations uh, of the Gracies, you know, in Brazil before. We already did the job for you, you know, like uh, we already proved the value of jiu-jitsu. So, you know, and I guess in his mind, he thought, Back then, he was kind of like a visionary. He said, if we keep just focusing on the, let's say, the mixed martial arts 
uh, I guess mixed martial arts right now, it's a professional career. But before, uh, what I say, the, the no, hold, no holds bar, you know, which was not, it was more, more like a primal compared to what we have today. Uh, he said, we're going to end up finding our own students because people are going to learn from us so they can use it against us. That's kind of like what his premise was. But for me and my brothers, we had a philosophy of, you know, share to grow and grow to sh grow sharing. You know, uh, Chuck Norris was our first big connection in the karate, karate world. And uh, we didn't have to fight anybody to start promoting jujitsu. So it became easy. Although we did have occasions, you know, we had somewhat challenges on our school back in the old days, you know, big wrestlers coming in and trying to go all out. But uh, for the most part, you know, one way or the other, whichever the approach you used, uh, it did serve the purpose of uh, bringing jiu-jitsu to the limelight. limelight. Jiu-jitsu must have felt like a superpower back then. You must have just absolutely destroyed people because they wouldn't have known anything. Yeah, I, I think like... The best example I give nowadays, you know, I have a good friends of mine who are jujitsu aficionados now, but I remember there's one gentleman, super nice guy, Coach Coach Steve from uh, Australia. He lives in Canberra. Really liked the guy. He used to be a boxing coach for my black belt, Anthony Perosh. And this guy is like of Croatian descent. You know, Croatians are really tall. They're actually the tallest people in the world between them and the, and the, the, and the Dutch. We don't know. One year, one is higher than the other. The other year, the other one takes the precedence. But anyhow, he could care less about jiu-jitsu when he said, oh, no, I don't like jiu-jitsu, this grappling thing. And then I guess one day he decided to go to a gym in the town that he used to live. And he rolled with a guy who was probably small. You know, I, I guess the guy, he's like, he was like, uh, I would say he was like, he was over 100 kilos. And the guy was like 60 kilos, 65 70 kilos, you know what I'm saying? And, and the guy just twisted him like a pretzel. And he was out of breath. He was tapped out a bunch of times. He was like, man, how'd that happen? So that kind of intrigued him, you know what I'm saying? And then the funny thing, man, this guy today trains more jujitsu than he ever did any boxing. And he was a professional boxer for a while. I'm not saying more at the time he was a professional in boxing, but that's all he does. He still coaches boxing and does personal training, whatever. But he does jiu-jitsu every day. He really, you see people transitioning into that. You know, uh, once they, jiu-jitsu is very powerful, you know, because it's literally like a spell. You know, it gives you a level of endorphins and a uh, sense of realization uh, when you train that uh, is hard to replicate. Yeah. If you go against somebody who doesn't know any, I remember you know, different people saying, you know, it's almost like you're playing with a kid. You know what I'm saying? Like once you get the guy into a grappling situation, man, they don't know what to do. Yeah. It's funny. I think, I think when you train for a while and you're used to working with people that have some level of proficiency, you often forget how, how useless the everyday person is. And I think yeah. it's that occasion, isn't it? Where you maybe sort of work with a, a brand new white belt for the first time and you're reminded and you're like, wow, you know, this would be so effective. Example today, there was, there was all white belts in the class, me and Steve, and it was a new, new guy. And just, just you know, I, I was like, I was showing him side control escape and I just kind of framed a little bit and he just fell backwards, like just naturally just fell backwards. And I was like, such an odd reaction, but it's probably the right reaction for, for most people. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because my, uh, my first exposure to, to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was probably back in around 2006. So in the UK at that time, there was very little jujitsu around at all. And we were mm -hmm. learning out of books and occasionally some guys would come back from the States having been to a seminar or a school. And I was doing Muay Thai at the time and I'd boxed prior to that. So I was quite a proficient striker. And a couple of the guys who were doing grappling and jujitsu, um, I'd start cross-training with them. And again, I was very much where I was like, I could light these guys up and then they just take me down and within within seconds were twisting up my arm or, or strangling me and you know it was it was absolutely remarkable i think today a lot of people have an idea that it's effective but for me when i first got exposed to it, it was you're absolutely right it was like a spell i think even now though normal people don't realize how effective it is you know if you speak to you know if i speak to some of our friends who don't do jujitsu they don't realize how incapable they are yeah, man, it's uh, what I like about jujitsu, you can uh, gauge the intensity 
you, you, you can make the guy, you know, submit the guy or make the guy give up. But you, you, you can do it in a way that the guy doesn't get hurt or you give the guy a little bit of leeway. You know, I, I actually like that part of the control, too, you know, it gives you. Yeah, it's something we've talked about a lot with with various guests and between ourselves as well. But the yeah, the ability to train at varying intensities without injuring or concussing your training partners is is great. It's it's such a fun thing and you know allows for for really good development, I think, and and bow testing within training, which is great. Hundred percent. That's that's actually what you said is one of the reasons that Chuck Norris became involved with jujitsu. Uh, he didn't want to get hit on the face. He was still doing a lot of uh, sparring in karate and kickboxing. But he was doing, he was kind of like still in the very peak of his acting career. He said, man, I got to do something else that I don't get hit in the face. Because if I got a bruise, I got to, you know, patch up. And, and I don't know how much that will show uh, when I have to do a filming or shooting the next day. And, and literally, that's one of the reasons, besides his curiosity uh, towards martial arts, uh, he, he admitted that that was one of the reasons that jiu-jitsu appealed to him. Yeah, tell us tell us about that time with Chuck Norris because obviously, you know, he's one of your not notable students, but as you say, he was, you know, he was very, you know, very popular at one point within Hollywood, very no very well known as, as a hard man. And even to this day, you know, the, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a chain in England, uh, a burger chain called Brewdog, and they've still got a burger named after Chuck Norris. There's <laughs> memes about Chuck Norris where when he does press-ups, he moves the earth. He's that, he's that much of a tough guy. So what was it like meeting and training with Chuck? Well, Chuck Norris uh, was a very accomplished martial artist became, before he became a movie star. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not, not going to say the name of all the actors. There were somewhat action stars. There were martial artists. He was a legit one. Chuck Norris had literally was a his tournament history is like karate with no gear, uh, bare knuckle kind of thing. No mouthpiece. People lose teeth out. You go for the grand championship. You have to be stitched up before you uh, went to the finals. Imagine this. You fight a tournament. You have a few matches before you go to the grand finale. You and your partner all cut because it was bare knuckle, right? And the doctors uh, on, on the call, on deck, they will stitch the guys up. And then got the guys prepped up to go fight. That's the term Mr. Chuck Norris used to do for the longest time. Until they started to realize, man, not many people is going to last uh, if you want to popularize that. They started to add the helmets, the gloves, and the shin guards and everything else. But uh, he's a guy from that era. So he, he, he was used to get hit in the face really hard. And he was a hard hitter as well, right? So with that said, he had photographic memory. Uh, when I taught him a move, uh, he would replicate that. I, I didn't have to correct him much, and he would get it right off the bat. There was a time we had a seminar at his organization in Vegas. He has a, you know, he had over a thousand attendees on this big convention room uh, in Vegas. And normally, me and my brothers would line up everybody, you know, and go against everybody, you know, grapple a little bit with everybody. And Chuck Norris, he was a blue belt back then. Most of the attendees were white belts, but there was a couple of guys that knew some grappling. And uh, Chuck Norris also stood uh, on one spot, and he was lining up people. You know what I'm saying? And I couldn't believe it. His best move was the X choke. He loved the X choke. <laughs> As a person, he was very genuine, uh, very down to earth, very humble. Uh, and he's the reason I came to Texas, because uh, in 92, he started filming uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. His uh, famous TV show, which was uh, one of the top uh, rating uh, uh, shows for a long period of time, you know. Uh, and uh, he invited me over, said, man, come to Texas. I'll let you uh, teach within my studio. You don't have to actually have a gym right away. Once you get enough students, you can go on your own. And that's pretty much what I did. So in 95, three years later, after, after that invitation, I finally came to Texas. And it was... Uh, one of the best decisions I ever made. But uh, besides that, he was one of the greatest advocates of jiu-jitsu and the Machado family by far. You know, one of the greatest. I don't even know. I don't even know how to respond to that because he's a legend. You know what I mean? Like he's so. I used to watch him when I was a kid. You know, and just uh, yeah, just that you knew him and trained him, and that's that's, that's super cool. 
He's a very humble guy. Yeah. So he was uh, so so a pretty good jujitsu practitioner at some point. Then I'd imagine. Yeah. Well, you know, understand that he was not like a in his twenties or thirties when he started mm -hmm. uh, his jujitsu, but he still became very proficient. I think at the time when I was training him, he was like purple belt level. Um, but what happened when the show took off, uh, it kind of created uh, uh, some issues for him to come and train as regularly as, uh, as he could. I'll travel with him on occasion when he had different projects or movies or uh, different things. He would come to my dojo here and there, but it became less and less because uh, doing TV shows is very gru grueling. It's like literally... It's like you do a movie in a week. A movie takes several months for you to do it. But the amount of work that you have to compress to make a one-hour episode every Saturday is like making a movie, uh, you know, five for five days of the week. So I think that's kind of burned him out a little bit, to be sincere with you. Because uh, he was not just the main star. He was the executive producer. He had to read every script because he was very particular about the content you know he cared about whatever people were saying uh and so after after that uh once in a while he would train but he became less and less mm -hmm. you know life, life happens he got married again you know his new wife uh got you know had a set of twins so there are a lot of other things going on yeah no life does get in the way sometimes I wanted to talk to you about Texas, actually, because you're widely regarded as the godfather of jiu-jitsu in Texas. And you mentioned that you've been there a very long time. It feels like Texas now is probably like the meta of jiu-jitsu. You've obviously got uh, Zanji out there. You've got New Wave. You've got the B team. So obviously, Texas, it feels like in the last few years, maybe five years, it suddenly exploded in regard to, well, I think popularity in general, but certainly within the jiu-jitsu space. Uh, what do you what do you what do you attribute that to, and what do you make of it all? Well, I, I think there are different reasons that you can elaborate. Okay, in my particular case, uh, there are different waves of uh, expansion of jujitsu. When I came first, I was the highest ranked, uh, I guess, uh, instructor in the area. So a lot of, uh, at least in the Dallas Metroplex and in some of the other big towns like uh, Austin, uh, San Antonio and Houston, I had uh, quite a few students of mine who migrated. Uh, they, they came and learned from me and eventually they migrated to those uh, population centers and developed their schools. So I have a lot of uh, direct affiliates of mine and indirect uh, I wouldn't say affiliates, but people that indirectly has been associated with me. So you can trace my roots really far out when you try to make a, you know, a calculation. Uh, definitely an influence out there. Now, uh, with the second wave in more recent times, I think there's a mixture of uh, opportunity and circumstances, right? So we don't have to go far, but Texas is called the land of the free uh, for a particular reason. Okay, People here are very independently minded. So uh, when we had the period of 2020 coming in, uh, a lot of other areas that, uh, you know, jiu-jitsu was thriving like Los Angeles and New York, they, they suffered a lot, right? So, and then not only that, on the aftermath, you know, I think for business, I think it's, it's better for many of them to come this way for that reason and all the other reasons that I suspect they made that choice. Okay, so um, it's not the best weather, believe me. You know, here's pretty hot. Uh, it gets mellow uh, in the fall. Spring is bearable for halfway. Winter is like hit and miss, but summer here is, you know. The ideal circumstances have two residences, one by the lake somewhere outside in the northern states, when it's summer, you know, uh, and summer here happens, I guess. I'm not sure. Are you guys on summer as well? I guess you are, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, we barely get a summer, though. Mate, to be the honest, yeah. <laughs> Te technically, yes, but not really. <laughs> yeah, not really. So, so I think, you know, you see guys like Joe Rogan, you know, and all the big guys like Elon Musk, you know, uh, 
all, all these big big shots, big wigs. Uh, it's not just jujitsu. I think there's quite a mm -hmm. uh, uh, a massive amount of. Uh, we had more Californians arriving here on a daily basis than anybody else, so, really. But anyhow, that's another rabbit hole. I think yeah, that's yeah. Uh, several several appealing things. And I know I gave my contribution. They nicknamed me the Godfather of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the Southwest. Okay, so I guess I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, do it. I think I think the thing that we should probably remind certainly our British viewers of, and, and because we. I think in the UK, because we're so small, we forget actually that there's some big places and, and Texas, you know, as a state is ginormous, isn't it, I think? Yeah. It's, it's probably like several countries put together. Yeah, yeah. How long does it take to fly from one side to the other? An hour. If you go to, from one tip to the other, I'd say an hour and a half, maybe, flight. Yeah. So, yeah. so you drive, yeah, you have I mean. to drive the whole day. Uh, yeah. Depending which side of the... If you're gonna go north, northwest, uh, you're gonna to have to drive all day, and it's still not gonna cross the state line. Yeah, we we can cover the the breadth of England in six hours, <laughs> six hours of driving. Yeah. So I think when when we say that Texas is like a matter of jujitsu, it feels it really does feel like it is, but actually it's you know it's it's like a, a number of different cities across the whole of England. It's that yeah. equivalent. So it's not as bunched as it probably feels. Yeah, I think Texas as a as a state, like you said, is is booming in it, and I think it is because of like you said, it's political views, it's right wing, it's you know, it's a bit more, you know, you can just do what you want, and I think a lot of Americans, especially, are uh, definitely wanting to wanting to be free, uh, a lot more free. Yeah, am I right in thinking they've got a mutual combat law in Texas? Is that right, or did I make this up? When you say mutual combat, uh, the rights. Yeah, so if, if you if you have a disagreement in a bar with somebody and you both agree to go outside and, and settle it with your fists, yeah, yeah, the the police won't arrest you for a fray or or anything. Yeah, I think I think um, at one point in time that was the case. I I haven't checked lately how it is, but uh, but the issue here, everybody has done <laughs> right. So arguments yeah, with, um, escalated, especially if you're in a bar and you got mm -hmm. got a little bit of alcohol in your system. Things could go airy, airy a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know if that's still a law, but uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be doing that with with all the guns out there. I'd be no. like, yes, okay, mate, you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, Carlos, when I when I watched your um, your presentation for your your eighth degree Carl Belt, um, in your speech you mentioned that your students gave you more than you ever gave them. Yeah, and I, I was really interested by that statement, and 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 wonder if you might just share with us, you know, what you meant by that. Right, so you have the circle of life, right? You are a student, and you become an instructor. Uh, you become a mentor, right? And then your student kind of travels through that same kind of loop. So he goes from student to assisting instructor, then an instructor on his own right. And, and it, it kind of goes, now, when I teach, a student is it's like the way knowledge works is I pass to him what I know he will integrate the way he interprets and adapts to it and turn that into something of his own so I can teach you an armbar that you may do slightly different than me and guess what your version might be actually better than mine when, once we go practice I realize Paul what, how are you doing that, you know? So so for me, there's that the raw fact that I learn from my students. When they start to replicate what I'm teaching them, they bring me back something better than what I delivered them often enough. You know what I'm saying? Because especially now that they can train more, they can study more, they come up. A lot of times it's not me teaching them. They come to me and say, hey, I saw this thing here. What do you think? I said, whoa, let me take a look, you know? So and this is like the coolest thing because – What's the most exciting thing about jiu-jitsu? You never stop learning. You, mm -hmm. you, you never reach that level that you know it all. You know, so students, they will teach you that the more you teach them, <laughs> the better you learn what you're giving them. So, so I feel like, man, I'm, I should be paying this guy because I feel like I'm getting better as I teach this guy. I was doing uh, a training session with a couple of black belts of mine yesterday. And we had the curriculum of the techniques. And I always challenge my techniques. 
I don't teach. By the time I teach a student something, I had people already trying to beat me down uh, against that particular move. So I have to upgrade the mechanics to a point that when I deliver, whoever's going to learn is going to learn as close as possible to what I consider sound mechanics, right? But uh, and then after that, I did some roll, uh, and the guys were putting me in some bad positions, and I love doing that. I said, "Man, go back." I would kind of—it's like I'm rewinding the tape, rewinding the clip. I put the guy over and over over the same position. Let me try this. Let me try that. Let me do this until I figure out. Okay, that feels better. You know, less effort and more ease, or s more simple. So I always try to find the three criteria: less effort, more simple, you know, more clear. You know, I, I want the techniques to be like that because if I'm going to add anything to anybody, I have to make sure that's transmissible in the most easy way. Yeah. So I guess uh, yeah, ultimately many minds are better than one, right? So I call it collective wisdom. Yeah. And as, as a coach, I mean, I've started coaching a little bit more recently um, and I'm still relatively new to it. I mean, there's so many different ideas around coaching, right? So you know, the, the philosophy side, you know, creating that psychological safety so people can ask questions and make mistakes. Then you've got the more technical component. So, you know, do you drill? Do you not drill? Do you do game-based training? Do you do live sparring? I mean, from your perspective, you've obviously got, you know, as much experience as, as most people on the planet. You know, from your coaching perspective, like what do you think the best way to teach jiu-jitsu is? All right, so I came to a lot of realizations um, throughout the years and in more recent times. A uh, couple of things. Less is more. Okay, you teach less techniques with more details, you will get much better results than trying to rush and show too many things. Okay, because uh, uh, you you don't want to learn something. You want to learn how to master something. You know what I'm saying? Because then becomes kind of like a part of your DNA, jiu-jitsu DNA, right? Uh, as an instructor, you are an entertainer. You know, you, you have to make sure people are at ease, relaxed, and have fun, every class. I think the best combination is mobility drill and uh, drills with resistance. Okay, you go about flows. To, I don't believe in warming up people with jumping jacks and push-ups. My, my students... I've been implementing mobility drills. They just go over, guard pass, the guy side escape, sweep, then the other guy guard pass. They kind of go half speed, you know, and they kind of try to, to whatever degree, you have a less or a more experienced partner doing it. It's like music, you know, like you have a conductor in an orchestra, you know, half the orchestra is out of sync, the other one is in tune, but eventually everybody gets it, like osmosis. Jiu-Jitsu, you learn by osmosis too. A lot of times you don't have to correct the guy. Because everybody's nervous system operates at a different level. Some go quicker. They're more gifted. They learn faster. So that's, and the other one who's impaired or he's learning or goes slower, you'll be surprised with them because they can be slow and steady. But once they get it, they can go deep and further. All right? Then we can elaborate on that. But uh, so I like mobility drills, resistance drills, and positional training. All right? So you can go random and do... Uh, just a normal sparring. Go free flow, free flow. Go stuff. But sometimes throughout the training, if you hit a technique more or a technique less, you got to figure out either on your plus or on your negative what it is that you have to enhance. So you walk out of the uh, session with some insight that you can carry on. I'm a believer in no taking. Okay, I have here, you know, always with me paper and ink, and I used to use my. Uh, cell phone but nowadays you have the screenshot app that you can actually turn everything into pdf and, and put on your notes so i don't like cell phones uh unless i'm going to film clips you know uh present because it's distracting i want people to be fully immersed uh and uh and also a lot of times too uh you have the i call the negative growth okay so negative growth is not that you're growing less on the negative you are trying to grow on the most negative aspect of yourself. You know, so let's say I cannot get out of anything. I'm stuck every time somebody, if Danny holds me down, he's bigger than me, he's stronger than me, he's technical enough that he knows how to keep me stuck there. I want to learn how to enjoy as much as I can 
that situation in terms of protecting my breathing and feeling comfortable and make sure that Danny spends more effort than me, even when I'm in a bad position. So if that's all I get, that's a major uh, accomplishment because in, in, in the scheme of things, you want to make your opponent more uncomfortable than you, even when you, they have a position of advantage. And you also want to make them spend more energy than you, even when it looks like you're in the worst possible scenario. So, so those premises right there help me dictate. I think, too, when you do troubleshoot, reverse engineer, you know, start from the last part. You're doing an armbar. Learn how to control the, you know, the EBI tiebreaker when you have uh, one guy. You know, yeah. okay, can you keep a guy long enough in order to break the grip and finish the armbar? What are you going to do? What if the guy escape? Can you do a chain uh, submission with a shoulder lock? So you got to figure out the best possible cases. And one last thing, I always like a plan A and plan B. If I fail in my first attempt, I'll make sure that I get him on the second. And if I don't, I reset the whole thing again. Okay. So, and we can extrapolate on theories and concepts when it comes to that. But giving the students that perspective, uh, they become masters on their own right because they know what kind of work they need to focus upon to get more results. And like I said from the beginning, less is more, less techniques and more details. Yeah, that's great. And, and do you advocate focusing on one position or uh, a sort of uh, one technique for, for a certain period of time before moving on to something else? Yeah, I like the 360 approach. You pick one thing and just work on that one technique. Let's say you're doing a submission, whatever that is, and figure out all the different starting scenarios that you can lead yourself into that particular situation. So it becomes systematic. You know what I'm saying? Like if I, if I do an armbar, how many positions can I do an armbar from? And then from that point, all I focus is transitions. How can I transition from point A to point B until I put the guy in that particular situation? Yeah, love that. I think it's the, I think it's the only way really to learn a technique. Um, you know, I've trained before where it was a different technique every class. And I th feel like sometimes I was getting something, especially as a, when I was a white belt, I was getting something, I was kind of understanding that and then I'd be onto something else. And then I'd really, I wouldn't come back to that previous technique for such a long time. That by the time I was coming back to it, I, I'd forgotten it. And that's what I was really struggling with. So I was trying to like watch videos to kind of bridge that gap. Whereas uh, in our coaching now, our, our current gym, we do that, don't we? we? We work on something for a week or even a bit longer, but it flows into the next aspect of it, which I'm, yeah, I absolutely love. Yeah. Every lesson plan that I have for the month is built upon the previous one. Uh, I never mm -hmm. disconnect. And then on the third month, I might go back to the first one. If you have 10 moves that you teach in 12 months, and that's all you do, but you work all the transitions towards that move, you're going to create monsters. At your <laughs> yeah. Create people that, you know, they're going to they're gonna be sharp shooters. Let's put it this way. Yeah, our current coach at the moment is a, is a big emphasis on, on guards. Um, his perspective, I think, is that, you know, you're often, you know, you're very often engaging with a guard, whether you're attacking and passing or defending it. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of emphasis on guard play at the moment, whether you're you're passing it or defending it. But of course, the two kind of interchange in a way, right? Yeah, well, the guard, if you're on top, what's your goal? And what, if you're at the bottom, what's your goal? And you have to kind of break down in priority. What's the most important thing? You know, if you have the answer, you build up from there. You know, uh, people say, what's your goal when you're passing the guard? I don't try to pass the guard. I try to make sure I don't get swept. I make sure I don't get tapped. You know, those are the two main goals that I have. Third, once I get those two out of the way, then I think about what setups I can use to make the guy spend more energy than me. Because that's the part that people don't realize. Passing the guard against an accomplished jiu-jitsu practitioner that has a good guard, uh, it's literally you burn your steam. You know, by the time you get to the top side, if you make that far, you know, God forbid, the guy puts you right back in the guard. <laughs> you know, it's like you're paying a toll that's really expensive. You know, so I figure here, I like the almost pass scenario. I, I just try to almost pass. And once I get there, I try to fight to keep that position as long as I can, uh, managing my effort, because then I know it's just one small stretch between the almost pass and the completion of the pass. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. 
they burned the candle in the scramble. Yeah, it's it's no real surprise. As you were talking, I completely, yeah, can completely empathise with that. I've been in many situations with good guard players where it's exhausting, and, and that's why we laugh to think because the amount of times I've finally got past the guard and they just get it back, and it's just like, <laughs> oh, so yeah. soul destroying. And and I wonder if this is, you know, it's obviously leg locks and leg entanglements have become obviously a very uh, sort of a popular approach for many people, you know, in recent years and. It almost feels that that's partly to do with it, right? They're obviously very effective. If you uh, if you get a good bite on a heel, then you can destroy someone's knee. But I think just the the, the shortcut without having to deal with those legs and the the guard obviously makes it a very attractive proposition for a lot of people. Maybe so, especially starting jujitsu to get into those leg entanglements. What are your thoughts on that as as an evolution of jujitsu at the moment? I think it's great. Uh, I think too, some people jump too quick without realizing. Uh, the intricacies of leg attacks and, and realizing that uh, the pressure on knees and the pressure on ankles, especially when you twist with heels, mm-hmm. heel attacks, um, when people tap, a lot of times it's already late, mm-hmm. you know, because the ligaments are built in a way that uh, the pain signal is not triggered fast enough. You know, you feel discomfort by the time you feel you need to tap, you passed the threshold. You know what I'm saying? So there's a catch and release rule when we do the twisting on legs. So people, they catch, release, and they go on. And then there is a a gradual uh, adjustment when you need to train the finish. You know, so we try to exercise control. But despite our best attempts, it's not uncommon when you go for tournaments. You know, you don't want to tap, you know, too soon or be scared if anybody goes for your legs. You got to learn so you can get the cat out of the bag. But I was actually talking to one of my friends, uh, Brandon uh, McCaffrey from 10th Planet, and I've seen a lot of tournaments, especially, especially the PGF, which I'm involved, uh, that the guys, they start attacking the legs almost simultaneously. One attacks, and the other one counters by attacking back. Mm. and literally becomes a race. Who's going to tie up the hold faster or better than the other? And it's not uncommon that the guy who starts is not the one who finishes. Yeah, that's that's my best offense, is if someone grabs my legs now or in any sort of position, I'll attack their legs to try yeah. and finish them faster because that's the only, sometimes that's the only way to actually get them off you. Yeah, so, and of course, you know, the pressure pass that you see today uh, with the body lock, that's an evolution from different guard passes that in the past, when you stand up, when you leave, your, if, you know, leave space between your knee and the ground, uh, people get hooks, they elevate you, they wrap you around, uh, or if you stand up. So, you know, a lot of people, not for wrong reasons, they try to stay low so they can <laughs> keep their feet and legs out of harm's way, you know. But then, then you know, you start developing the, the back takes and the other, you know, evolution that comes from the different body positioning. So uh, it, it's nice to see. It's it's a game. It's a it's chess. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think just the more you think about it, the more it blows my mind. I've only been doing it a few years and it just, you know, it just feels like an endless, <laughs> I don't know, just an endless view of, you know, t- talking to people like you and then everyone has a slight different view on the same sort of stuff and it's all, you know, it's body type or it's experience. And it's, yeah, it just fascinates me to a point where I just, I just want to do it like all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting point that, that Danny talked about there, obviously being, you know, in the grand scheme of things, relatively new, as, as I am in fairness, certainly talking to you as well. But, you know, someone coming into jujitsu because it is such a vast topic to learn. I mean, you know, for yourself, when you have someone come in that's brand new to it, where where do they even start? What's your, what's your sort of best starting position for people or entry point? Man, I tell you what I do. I give them the real perspective on day one. If you want to be a grappler... If you want to be a jiu-jitsu student, learn how to swim on a flat surface like the the mats. I teach them how to swim on the mats. Literally, it's not shrimping. You know, it's just literally you move your shoulders, you swim on your elbows, you swim everything. Because literally, when you learn how to swim on the mat, you stop drowning. Because it's easy for you to deal with pressure when people try to crush you. You keep one shoulder off the ground, even if that's all you can do, you already eliminated the pressure on your diaphragm. You know, uh, facing away sometimes is better than facing the person. You know, you look for comfort, you know. 
uh, when you hold, you keep it. You know, so I say, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. I teach them more to pull than to push initially. And the other thing, inch by inch, right? So you don't try to do big moves. You try to go inch by inch, like you climb your rope, going one inch at a time until you reach the top. You know, you grab the ankle and then you climb the, to the knee, then you climb to the hip, then you go for the elbow, then you go for the neck. You know, you just kind of like, and then I, I kind of put like a, the arms open and I make them count all the joints. You know, not the fingers, but wrist, elbow, and shoulder, and then the head is the crown, then, you know, hip, knees, and, and ankles, and, and, and toes. And then basically I said, okay, this is your map. You know, when you climb, submission is what? You trap, you squeeze, you twist. That's how you're going to get, you know, the pressure to eventually affect the joint. And, and then the other thing is, once you get out of something, Make sure you get your partner or your opponent into something. The whole thing about you get out of something and the guy doesn't get into anything, it becomes too much of a, you know, a script in which, man, you're not taking advantage of uh, opportunities. You know, you got to have, uh, in a positive way, malicious intent. You know, if I get out of something, I'm going to make you pay. That's kind of like my mindset. Yeah, that's really interesting advice. And it's uh, such a, a really cool take on it. And then in regard to, I guess, the actual learning from that point forward, do you feel that there's like fundamental positions or techniques that people should learn first? Or do you think it's just really intuitive and you, you go with your, your curiosity and your body takes you? Yeah, so you don't teach jiu-jitsu. You teach people how to move their bodies in certain positions, all right? What, you, what, what I figure here is I think people, they mess up in the beginning because they try, they try to overcorrect people. Uh, if you if I'm teaching you something and you don't get hurt doing doing it the wrong way or your training partner, I let you make the same move wrong a hundred times before I correct you. Because what happened, you are awakening your nervous system. Do you want to know how you learn jujitsu? I can give you here a perspective that probably you might know but you haven't heard. Please. Imagine you're blind. Imagine you're deaf. You cannot hear, you cannot see. The only thing you have, you can feel, right? Is the surface of your body, the tips of your fingers, you know, of your hands, of your feet, of your, of your, of your body, that actually learns jujitsu, is how he feels, right? So now let's go back. Uh, what happens if I teach you a move? It travels from the surface to your brain. That's just one connection, right? So if I put you to train right away, guess what? You're not going to do it because you didn't close the circuit. The circuit only closes when the brain sends the signal back to the surface. So you have to have a two-way connection. Are you with me still? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What happened is the only way you make the brain connect is through intensity. Uh, if I teach, uh, if I do a drill, I, I don't, I tell the guys, if I tell you to do reps, I don't tell you how many reps you have to do it. And I don't time your reps. I just care that you figure out when you got enough that you, you, that you got it. You have to feel that you got it. So there's a criteria. It's less effort. It's more simple. It's more clear. And it's more executable. Meaning you can do against a guy who lets you do it and you can, Pretty much do when the guy doesn't let you do it. Of course, granting that if you're still learning a move uh, early on, if the guy resists 100%, it's unlikely you're going to be able to go all the way. But I want you to have a threshold. If you can do up to 50% resistance, all you have now is 50% left, left to build upon. You know what I'm saying? So I keep pushing that threshold up to the point where you fail. So if you fail the 80%, now I tell the guy, just reduce a little bit uh, the intensity until the point that you can do it. But everything has to be done with effort. That's how the brain connects. So when you go train or compete, I had this experience. I made it uh, on accelerated learning. Uh, you know, like uh, if you shake the body, let's say I, you want to do a number on me, all you have to do is shake your body, shake your arm. The guy has to actually hold your arm, otherwise the arm slip. And then when the guy goes and gets the leg over your face, try to tuck your elbow in. 
try to tuck the elbow in. And then the guy's going to start to connect the body to your elbow and stuff. And he or she, they're going to figure out that once you have body connection, you have control and you can actually complete the position. It's all about connecting the surface of your body with more area. Uh, you know, if you want to be successful in the armbar, the elbow doesn't matter. It's, the sh it's your hip on the guy's shoulder. If you have the hip on the shoulder, you swallow the whole arm with your body. You know, stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? So, man, we can talk this all day. I love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> back how you build, it's in small increments. I like slow and steady. Like the whole thing. Uh, you know the snowball? Okay, I teach you one move, and you're really doing that well. Then I add another move, no move number two. And guess what move number three is? For you to put number one and number two together. That's move number three. I don't teach you something different. And then once you're putting those two really well together, I teach you move number three. And then guess what's move number four? You go back and do number one, number two, and number three, or you just do between two and three. Oh, you got three moves? Okay, go from one to three. Now go from three to one. I tried, I call that the Central Park style. Central Park style has to do with the guy with the three cups uh, in the fur ball in the middle. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those? Games, uh, what, what yeah. do they call that? There's a name for it. Uh, yeah, it I, know, I know what you're on about. I don't know what they're called. Though. No, I don't. You, you know what I'm talking about. I never mean yeah, 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 yeah. I always bet five bucks because if I lose, it's not, it's not, not going to hurt <laughs> that bad. But, you know, they, in a lot of times, they are not actually even moving the cup that is hiding the, you know, the marble. Uh, you know, they just keep moving around. So that's what you got to do. You got to learn how to integrate each move sequentially and then change the order so you can combine them. So you multiply the possibilities. And then you keep adding on and following the system. Man, you're going to have a chess player before you know. Yeah, I love that. We, we had a conversation with Kit Dale. Oh, I was about to talk about him. Kit Dale was the first guy that mentioned that that I saw. He doesn't believe in drills. No. No, and, and he had some, yeah, he had some really interesting ideas. And one of the things he also talked about was um, not only like the intensity and the problem solving of training, but but creating some sort of emotion, attaching some sort of emotion to it as well. And he felt that, you know, you learn better when there's there's like a consequence or there's some stakes involved. And, you know, I guess to some degree, if you're training at a higher intensity, you may achieve that. But he also sort of talked a little bit about creating um, sort of, I don't know, competition environments in, in the gym and, you know, would often encourage people to spar with people watching or on camera. Um, just to add those extra stakes and add that emotion to it as well. Do you find that's something that also benefits learning? No, I, I don't go that far. I like the approach on uh, doing the, the drills dynamically, right, with uh, levels of resistance until you fail and engage from that point on. Positional training, where you start from the position you want to work on. But uh, competition... I look at competition, it's my own self. You know, I'm not I'm not competing against anybody. I want to be a better version of myself. Like if I rolled my black belt two days ago and there are some things I was able to do, some others I experienced difficulty. I'm going to roll the same guy again tomorrow. And I already kind of figured out and started to work on some uh, adjustments. So when I go against him, I can figure out how I can uh, time and execute some of the counters to his positions or counters right so i use your own measure uh for me literally it's a almost like an introspective the training partner is a tool you know so and, and the thing is if i hit my target uh it's, it's kind of like i want to i want to open the floodgate i don't want to tap you let's say i want to do a, a, a an x choke arm bar on you when i'm on top right in a good situation I want to make sure my transition is so sharp when I pass your guard and I how e how much ease I get to transition to the mouth. And by the time I choke you, you either you're gonna give me your arm or you're gonna give me your neck. And if you sweep me or roll me over, I put you right back on the same position again. So I want to create precision in a game, you know. So so the game is the incentive in itself, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't want my student to settle for a failed attempt. I want, I want him to tell me I almost got it or I want him to tell me I didn't get it, but now I get it. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to be either one or the other. He's aware of his threshold, how far he is into the move, 
and he's aware of what, what he needs to do to close that gap between almost doing and actually accomplishing the goal. You know, so I, but competition uh, is a tip of an iceberg. You have a handful of people that compete successfully, and some schools are largely based on competition. Mm -hmm. And then you have on the base a much greater number of people that may or may not have interest in competing, but they enjoy the jiu-jitsu lifestyle, and they want to train forever. So that's the crowd that I really feel is the one that you need to focus on because the competitors, their intensity is their bliss and their curse. All right? At one point in time, their bodies are going to succumb to the high level of intensity that they apply mm -hmm. themselves, you know, as often compared to the average Joe. I believe in longevity. So for me, I don't care if I lose to the world champion. I just want to make sure that he works some effort to get me. All I care. That's my accomplishment. I, oh, I didn't tap the world champion. Man, that guy, he had a sweat going with me. For me, that, that's all I entertain. You know what I'm saying? And, and jiu-jitsu for me, on, on, if you ask, what's your goal when you train jiu-jitsu? I want to make sure the guy I roll with at the end of the match is more tired than I am. That's my number one goal. Everything else derives from there. Yeah, I like that. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I'm curious about the longevity thing because I'm I'm kind of just the wrong side of 40 now. I've been training on and off for, for getting close to 20 years and not always been training, you know, in the in the most sensible way. So my body's taken a little bit of damage over the years and I am at a point now where I, I'm having to ma actively manage some niggles and some injuries. Uh, and you're obviously, you know, as you mentioned, I won't repeat your age again, but... Uh, you know, uh, been doing this a while, should we say, and still very active in the trenches. What what's been like the biggest thing that you've you've done to maintain a healthy body to ensure longevity in jujitsu? It's kind of like vampire's blood. You know, once you once you drink it, you gotta do it forever. When it comes to healthy lifestyle, now don't get me wrong, I still have to shed twelve pounds. I've been traveling, indulging on my eating out and stuff. But uh, I already made the diligence to work on it. My health, my all markers and measures are great, you know, health-wise checkups annually and stuff. But uh, going back to the first is the mindset. Train smart, stay humble. Mm -hmm. That's the motto of my gym now. Train smart, stay humble. What do you mean by train smart? Uh, as often as you can, uh, you have to strategize and optimize, okay? Strategize means... Uh, you know what your ultimate goal is, you know, and everything is uh, adjusted to the ultimate goal. And mine is, I want my guy to be more tired than I am. That's my ultimate goal. Uh, and, and of course, improving the techniques is necessary because people, familiarity breeds difficulty. If you're training the same guy over and over, he's going to start to catch up with what you're doing. Instinctually, uh, he's going to, you know, counter or make more difficult for you so he's always have that challenge but uh overall hacks supplementation vitamins minerals electrolytes i hydrate myself a lot i i take a lot of salt in my diet i'm an adept of the uh, omnivore diet i have primarily meat uh and some veggies and fruit uh paul saladino is the guy that i follow uh, he was on joe rogan podcast he's a has a movie, uh, not a movie, a book he wrote called Carnivore Cold. He has a web uh, a, a podcast that he used to do more actively. I'm not sure how much he's doing that now, called uh, Fundamentals of Health. And he does his supplementation uh, called Heart and Soil. You know, George St. Pierre has some products that are, uh, that he that he's an endorser and stuff. But anyhow, going back to the mat time, okay, um, you. You have to control your pace. The only have you ever watched uh, Daredevil uh, on Netflix? Yeah. The series on Marvel. How many of you have watched it? Yeah, yeah, I've watched it. Yeah, you did. Okay, it. so yeah. you remember when he was getting his butt kicked by the ninjas at one point in time? There was one season that they sent this ninjas that in the beginning, <laughs> yeah, he was getting the crap beat out of them, right, of him, because Daredevil was trained to listen to the breathing and the ninjas had control of their breathing so he couldn't anticipate them because he couldn't read them right so his master taught him you got to hear the heartbeat because when the guy's going to attack you there's a fluctuation on the heartbeat 
Okay. So the answer that I got from there, and I learned that also from a student of mine at Brow Belt out of Austin, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nelson, Todd Nelson. He he does a, some approach called old man jujitsu. And uh, basically use a heart rate uh, monitor and try to make sure your heart rate is not above 90% of the maximum capacity. That will reduce your cortisol dramatically. So you're not going to feel actually worn out after a long training session. Uh, you're going to feel actually refreshed. And you can train every day uh, because you're going to cut down your recovery dramatically, uh, not feel as much soreness. So... Yeah, that sounds great to me, mate. I'm only 34, but that sounds right up my alley. <laughs> I love that sloth jujitsu that's going around where everyone's like, it's really slow and it's methodical. I, 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 that's, that's, I like that jujitsu. That's, that's why I kind of try and do control positions and move move nice and easy. Yeah, it's reassuring to hear that because that, that is essentially the approach that I've felt I've been forced to take over the last couple of years. So it's, it's nice to hear that I'm, I'm probably doing the right thing at this point. Yeah, man, uh, just like uh, it, it's a journey, Paul. It's a journey. You know what I'm saying? You, you, and you have to be inquisitive and, and a critical thinker. What are the people they are doing well doing? You know, and it's not what they say, it's what they do. You know, they, you know, bear with me, there are a lot of uh, fake people out there that you got to, you know, sort out. But I, 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 I want to I wanna experiment with things that I know for a fact, you know, have proven giving me results and some of them I'm telling you already have done. So I can tell from personal experience that that makes a difference. Mm, absolutely. And I wanted to ask, cause it always fascinates me because this is, is such like a, you know, it's an answer that can, can be answered in many ways, but when you meet somebody in the street and they say, you know, nice to meet you, Carlos, what do you do? And you say, I I'm involved with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And they say, what is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? What do you say to them? Well, uh, most people do their homework if, if it's in a gym situation. On my affiliation, it's they do their homework. It, they already know what, somewhat what they are looking for. But uh, casually speaking, if it's a lame person, I say it's a lifestyle. It's a, it's a lifestyle. You know, we have the lessons on the mat that we want to take off the mat. So overall... Uh, jiu-jitsu is appealing it's a longevity martial arts you know i i can do from 8 to 80 you know it's just like i said using some of the ideas that we have already talked about and uh and i think it's a motivational tool man because i have a lot of guys who are not uh young guns you know they are in their 40s their 50s some in their 60s that they don't have an activity that really you know hobby wise or lifestyle wise that really gets them pumped up, you know? And I have guys that have jobs that they do that they're not happy about. And they always tell me, man, I know that at the end of the day, no matter how crappy my day was, I'll have a, I would have a, a great day because I'll have a great day because I know I'll end up at the gym. And by the time I leave the gym, I'm renewed, I'm reborn. You know, the endorphins in jiu-jitsu is like the best drug you can take. Yeah, it's, it is remarkable. I think... It's a combination of, I think, you know, like that. It's the endorphins and, you know, sort of learning something. But I, th I find the brotherhood and the camaraderie in jiu-jitsu is, is quite exceptional when you compare it to, to other sports and other martial arts. Why do you think that is? You touched on a point there, the social component, right? So for some, jiu-jitsu in the beginning is a crutch. You know, they want to either replace something or add something to their lives, their lives that they're lacking, Okay. Once they integrate jiu-jitsu in their lifestyle, it becomes a pillar. So, man, and I, I can tell uh, you, you probably can relate to what I'm going to say. Most of the best relationships that I see happening in the lives of my students is not with people outside the gym. It's with the very relationships they build amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon that you have one guy that has a problem. He doesn't even call a relative. The guy calls a teammate. Hey, bud, you know, this is happening. And if the guy doesn't show up or somebody sees a post on social media that the guy seems like to, to be in trouble, everybody jumps, you know, on board and start to reach out to that person, you know. It's literally, it's, it's a very natural, uh, spontaneous, uh, I think, behavior. Uh, people care about one another on the mat more than any other space that I've seen. Yeah, it's quite something. And 
I often talk about Danny and I working together on this podcast. And, you know, people always say, have you guys ever fallen out? And I was like, we actually haven't. We, we, we disagree on plenty, but we've never fallen out. But I think the couple of times that we've maybe come close, we'll just go fancy, fancy a roll and we'll go and train. <laughs> and by the end of, of that training session, you know, we, we, can find a, we can find a common ground and agree quite easily. And I think that's definitely, I don't know if you agree, but I no, find that facilitates us working yeah. well together for, for the time we have. Yeah, I think it just, it makes you honest. It just, it just changes the whole dynamic of anything. You know, if in a, in a normal situation, if you get a bit annoyed or pissed off with someone, you're like, oh, I can't, I can't really sort that problem out. Whereas with us, we can <laughs> effectively, you know. And um, yeah, it's never nasty, but it's always competitive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's part of life, man. You know, the trick is how can we agree to disagree, you know? <laughs> but I think that's part of like, you, you talk about being humble. And I think, you know, I find this just in my professional life as well. And, and just working with other people through jujitsu and the ability to concede ideas and positions or whatever, and, and being humble in the workplace and in life. I'm happy being wrong and I'm happy conceding other people's ideas and, and, you know, agreeing. And I've just found that has given me so much advantage in, in many different aspects, just through being humble and being okay with being wrong and making mistakes. Yeah. Look, jujitsu is a reflection of life, you know, and I feel ultimately what we are doing, we are improving people's lives through the martial arts. Jujitsu is just the language that uh, creates the conditions for that to happen. Yeah, absolutely right. And we talked we've talked a little bit obviously about, you know, how far jujitsu's come from from when you were four and, and doing it back home to, to now. Like thinking about the future, where where do you think the future of jujitsu is going? Do you think it is gonna be sort of no gi professional competition? Um, do you think it's gonna be, you know, I, I don't know, like what what do you think? What's your perspective of it? Well, uh, it seems like in, in certain aspects it's going that way. Um, of course, there's still some ground to cover in regard to make it a professional career that would uh, accommodate, you know, a larger number of athletes. Uh, we have like the CJI and ADCC happening, you know, in a, you know, tomorrow and throughout the weekend. You know, the two million, <laughs> two million dollar purse from uh, Craig Jones and all that stuff. That's un unheard of, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know how sustainable that approach is in the long haul, but from what I've seen, it has caused a steer in the industry, at least with the big, bigger, big players so far. I see there is some ground to cover in that part, but uh, if you ask me on a, from my personal perspective, I think the job I had is so far from yet being accomplished. Because uh, despite the fact we have a great number of uh, practitioners of uh, jiu-jitsu nowadays compared to when I started, still you have sports like basketball, football, you know, baseball, hockey. They have such a higher number of adepts compared to jiu-jitsu. Uh, and, you know, even different martial arts like taekwondo, karate, that jiu-jitsu has yet so much room to grow. And I think, like, if you look at the demographics, of uh, metroplex areas like Dallas or big cities like LA and other areas, uh, you never have, you will never, I tell you this, you will never have enough instructors for the demand of what's available for people yet to become uh, students. You know, the prospects of jujitsu candidates as students is so infinitely large that uh, it's going to take it's going to take some time to to cause a dent, but it, it has already caused an impact by far. We're all mainstream already. You have so many celebs doing it other than Chuck Norris, you know. Does that worry you at all when you think about, I guess, supply and demand of good coaches to, to people interested? Do you worry that you're going to see such an expansion of jiu-jitsu that maybe some of the instructors out there teaching wouldn't be teaching maybe the, the best style of jiu-jitsu or the best kind of approach to jiu-jitsu well if you look at human activity you're going to always have the good the bad and the ugly this is my area you know what i'm saying so i can't worry or focus on the bad i gotta figure out how i can make it good how i can make it better. 
You know what I'm saying? So uh, there will be people that maybe won't be deserving of the respect because they might be impersonators. You know, they, they may be credible, but not with integrity. Mm -hmm. There might be some of those. That happens in martial arts all across, you know. Uh, I guess imposters, imposter syndrome. There will be some people that will say they are something they are not or teach something that's not what, you know, they really mean to, to teach. You know, I, I, I will be too worried about that if, if I don't focus on the other part is how I can make this better. So I have a motto. How can I make today's class better than the one yesterday? You know, that's my focus, you know. And then tomorrow, I'll make sure the class tomorrow is better than the one today. When I feel I'm doing the same thing over and over, then I start to worry. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. it's the same class, you know. So I think we, ha we have to be more diligent about the quality of what we produce instead of worry about whether the industry is going to go one way or another because who knows? Maybe everybody's going to turn bad and you're going to be a beam of light. You're going to be an island where people can have a refuge to go to, to learn the, the honest or decent way of, uh, you know, doing jujitsu the right way. Yeah, no, that's fair. And uh, you mentioned Brandon earlier. We had him on the podcast recently and we, we were chatting to him about kind of gi versus no gi. And he made an interesting point of, of his thoughts, which were that he feels that like sort of gi will always play a, play a role because of the tradition and everything else that comes with it and he felt that maybe sort of gi would almost kind of be like an introduction in, into jiu-jitsu for many people almost like uh like the amateurs and he felt that professionally uh no gi is probably where it's going to go just because it's a little bit more marketable and um the promoters have got a little bit more control over the rule set and everything um so i thought it was quite an interesting summary of it are you kind of aligned with that thinking what do you what do you think I think the format and rules of tournaments determine the taste. Mm. You know, you can spice things up, you know what I'm saying, uh, in a way that uh, either either side will become appealing. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I may agree with him in part, but not altogether that now the rules that you see happening with the, uh, the main – Excuse me. Sorry, I kicked here. The main jujitsu uh, tournaments. Uh, if you don't reevaluate, you have to ask what's fair for the athletes, what's appealing for the public. If you don't have an answer that fits both in the same equation, you're going to always lack one or the other. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think Nogi, uh, there are rules that they're trying to make the rules more appealing, no matter what tournament there is, and even themselves. They fell short on some occasions because uh, when they did, the, the specter of stalling, you have two accomplished athletes that know so much and they're so well conditioned, they have the power to stall if they choose to do so. Okay, It happens in wrestling. Sometimes it can happen in judo. You see Olympic level guys or wrestlers, when they score some points ahead of the other, they kind of cook the clock, per se. You know, uh, It's not uncommon. That's strategy. They are playing the rules to their advantage. So we have to always revisit. Uh, I think on the day-to-day -day to the academies, I don't believe Gi will ever phase out. Uh, I don't believe because it's such an intricate part of the tradition of martial arts. It's hard, hard for me to imagine without it. But I think the combination of having Gi and no Gi uh, makes it even more... Uh, of an opportunity for school owners or instructors to go beyond just focusing on either one or another. You know what I'm saying? There's there's room for both. But yeah. he may be right on his assertion, you know. So definitely I don't see yet a jiu-jitsu gi tournament that's paying the money that Abu Dhabi or CJI is doing it, you know. Like they say, money talks. Certainly does, and I agree. There's there's certainly a place for both. I certainly enjoyed both. So um, him him less so much, but but I do. I've been in the gi quite a lot lately. I've been you surprising have, myself. I've trained in the gi today again, doing three or four sessions a week at the moment in the gi. I'm actually enjoying it a bit more. Yeah, I am genuinely. I'm starting to, uh, I don't know, just yeah, just work, use it more. Yeah, I think when you can, when you weaponize the gi, it's, it's great yeah, fun it's to fun, use. Isn't it? 
Yeah, it's good fun. Carlos, you, t- tell us what you what else you're getting up to, my friend. You you mentioned earlier that you were involved with um, the, the 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 PGF with Brandon. Like, what else have you got going on? All right. So I uh, I have the PGF as a board member. You know, Brandon McCaffrey. I know him for several years. Uh, you know, we had some occasional uh, seminars that I thought he participated. We had seminars that we taught together uh, different times. I got to go to the first, not the first, the last season they had in Vegas. I'm due to be there again uh, in November. Uh, I have a, a portal called the MachadoMethod.com. That is a portal for people to hop in. I have some uh, videos there. They're available. They have been mainstream for a while. Some hook flips and collections like a gi one called Infinite Jiu-Jitsu, which was very successful uh, when it was first launched. And a few other freebies that people can see. You also displays all the locations of my organization, the Carlos Machado Jiu-Jitsu Association. We have over 140, almost 150 academies throughout the United States, uh, some in the UK, actually, uh, in Australia. And uh, basically, here we also have a, a nutrition and apparel line called cmjjgear.com. So if you want to buy some fancy Carlos Machado shirts, you know, or check it out, it's a good place to go. Uh and uh, our association here says cmjjassociation.com. I thought everything was on Machado Method. My bad. So there, and I, I usually I don't solicit people. I just say, this is what I do. And let me, t- let me tell me what you need. And uh, if you are in a good place and you have good people around you, give you mentorship and support, by all means, stay where you are. If you're abandoned, an orphan, or somebody that needs some direction, hey, I can be on your corner. So it's either one or the other. I don't sell. I just tell you as it is. I have a couple of events that happen uh, twice a year, usually the second weekend of April. And right now I have one coming up uh, between October 10th and the 13th. Uh, we have a, a venue here in Dallas, a hotel. We have like uh, hundreds of uh, martial artists, uh, instructors, and students from across the United States, some from out, out, outside the United States that come to do an immersion on jiu-jitsu and learn a lot of business and marketing as well. So I have some good laugh together. It's like literally uh, kids in a candy shop, so to speak, a bunch of adults and some, some teens that go there and just, you know, enjoy sharing time on the mat and off the mat together. Uh, I do have uh, my dear affiliate from uh, the UK out of crew, uh, Mr. Damien Glashin. Uh, he's been our representative in the UK. He's been assisting uh, recruiting some of the guys out there who want to just take a look. Uh, I'm, I'm envisioning being there in the UK again in March or next year, possibly. I do a once a year event. I would love to have you guys popping in uh, whenever I'm there. That would be great. I don't know how guys, how far, it's near Manchester, you know, of all places. I'm not sure. If it's, it, to be honest, yeah, it's not, uh, all over the UK, it's not too far. You know, it's only a short drive, really three or four hours maximum. Really, okay, so. cool. Yeah, you know, and a uh, lot of things going on. I got, you know, the podcast, like you said, over here on the back, should be up and running in the very near future. And, uh, man, a lot of trips going on. Be, be in New York right now for a mastermind uh, Saturday and Sunday. Got to be in the Carolinas. Got to be in uh, – I don't even know. I have my calendar. I'll send you guys the links mm-hmm. if you guys want to ever catch up with. I do tours in Australia once a year, usually in the month of May. So I'll be there. You know, it's kind of fun. I go from town to town, visit everybody, and pretty much do what I love, which is sharing the mats and, and teaching and learning from everybody. You know, I'm sure Danny has some cool moves he wants to show me. So uh, I would not mind spend some time with you and you, and you, Paul, you know, mm-hmm. just yeah, catch up with the latest, you know. Yeah, and you've got some you, you got some nice coffee as well coming out. Where, where can we buy that? Yeah, well, yeah, Stay Humble Coffee. Yeah, it's on the, on the CMJJ gear. You know, you can get, and they're freshly roasted. We roast them upon demand. So, you, you know, just uh, it's, it doesn't stay on the shelf. By the time it goes to your shelf, it, it will be the first shelf it stays. And hopefully it won't last that long. I, I love coffee, mate, so I might take you up on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what's your, uh, what's your podcast going to be about besides the obvious? Uh, is it oh, what's going to be about? It's a mixture of uh, mindset, health, lifestyle and martial arts so it'll be a combination of the three but i'm going to have a lot of outsiders people that have nothing to do with martial arts but that are instrumental to uh areas of knowledge that i think can benefit us uh on and off the mats 
no doubt there's going to be some absolute knowledge bombs on there. So I look forward to watching that. And yeah, when you're in the UK, Carlos, it'd be great to catch up, whether we come to you or you come to us. But it's never too far in the UK, as Danny said. So um, so yeah, hope to meet you in person. And and listen, this conversation has definitely been one of the most insightful I've had. So I'm very grateful. So thank you very much for your time. But Danny was kind of quiet right there. You're the one that did most of the questions, Danny. Come on, man. <laughs> To be honest, you mate, I'm just I'm just taking it in, you know. I'm just listening, and uh, yeah, I'm just taking in what you're saying. Sometimes it's uh, it's it's good to listen. All right, but I'm just joking here. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm I'm normally the one that 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 bangs on with the questions, but yeah, he is he is unusually quiet. But I think he is just absorbing the knowledge, mate. So uh, so yeah, he's a lot more chatty in person. Don't worry. Thank you. Well, that was a pleasure, man. I hope that uh, your listeners enjoy, and uh, I'd love to hear some feedback if you have any questions that arise out of this uh interview you know uh, we can do a, a quick follow-up or just do some exchange or post yeah definitely and i can send you some clips you know uh yeah. for the questions yeah man uh, let's make sure that this is not the first and last all right i want to stay in touch with you guys yeah now look forward thank to you, that Carlos. thank you again buddy appreciate your time awesome thank you <laughs>